Welcome to LPAC TV. I'm Chris Landry and John Hofel is joining me once again in the studio here. The universe is presenting very complex problems to us, threatening to completely wipe us out. We got fires in Texas wiping out like most of West Texas right now. Tornadoes are destroying most of the uh, central and eastern United States. Earthquakes are threatening to wipe California off the map. Um, you know, of course, all along the Pacific Rim of Fire. And uh, meanwhile, we're wrestling with a financial crisis. You do have a, a resolution in the House, uh, H.R. 1489, uh, introduced by Marcy Kaptur, co-sponsored by uh, Jim Moran and Walter Jones. So what does this mean, John? Well, the fact that Glass-Steagall has been reintroduced is a very healthy development because if we don't pass Glass-Steagall, this nation will cease to exist. Now, that may sound like a strong statement to some, and, and it is a strong statement, mm -hmm. but the, the global monetary system, this British imperial monetary system, is disintegrating. You can see this, especially in the transatlantic world. You look at the United States, the Federal Reserve and its money pumping, we're already into the early stages of a hyperinflationary blowout of the dollar. If you look at the Eurozone, the Euro is collapsing. These nations are all collapsing. Uh, Britain is collapsing. You see political opposition in Ireland and Finland, uh, political opposition growing in some of these nations that are being basically destroyed because the demands for austerity are going to, are killing the population. Mm -hmm. But this whole thing is coming down. It's not a question of uh, can they keep it going, it's a question of when is it going to come down. Hmm. And the consequences of it blowing up are chaos, the world entering a new dark age. So the, the, there's only one solution to this, and that is the assertion of national sovereignty by the United States and other nations to put this British imperial system through the equivalent of a chapter 11 bankruptcy to restore a sovereign credit system and to begin to rebuild the world. There's no way that we can pay off these debts, the quadrillions of dollars of outstanding obligations, right? So it seems that a lot of what you have coming out of the, the governments basically being promising and being demanded uh, that they pay these outstanding obligations. This is the form of the bailout, right? Right. Uh, there's no way they can do it, so it seems that uh, it's just a matter of stalling on the side of the, the empire. The monetary system is just, it's just stalling. It's just like, we're going to wait this thing out, basically. And in the process of waiting out, you're going to kill people. Not just like, we're gonna, you know, it's not just that you're going to go in and kill people, but the fact that you're cutting out basic services like the fire departments, police, you know, first responders and things like that, and also cutting out the scientific institutions which could, uh, for instance, see things that are going to occur like, you know, uh, tornadoes or earthquakes or whatever, and then successfully plan on how to move populations and, you know, get them out of the way of harm, get them out of harm's way. It seems like by just waiting these things out and then shutting down all these uh, operations, institutions, whatever, that people are going to die as a result of this. It's not like a one-to-one -one thing where they're like the the empire is going to you know in with like Hitler and you know gas chambers and killing people, but you're left to the whim of nature, which is acting up right now. Yeah, they would prefer to do it this way rather than the uh, the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. But those that idea is never far from their mind either. But yeah, you have I mean civilization has developed as mankind has learned to solve these problems and protect himself from the, the violent forces of nature. Mm -hmm. And as we are learning in our, as we progress scientifically, that there are violent forces out in the universe that we also have to be concerned with. Mm -hmm. You know, so as, as Lyndon LaRue said in his webcast, you know, and you said in the introduction, we faced two major problems. The one here on Earth, the one dealing with the financial system is actually the easy one. Mm -hmm. And the problem we face is that the, 
that the death is already locked in. That the, the collapse of the productivity of the planet, which we have seen since this financial bubble blew up in 2007 and was generally recognized to be blowing up by 2008, is that the carrying capacity of the world, the relative potential population density of the planet, has fallen below the population, mm -hmm. which means that the population will fall because it's, you know, you can't have more people than your carrying capacity for very long. In potential, we have far less people than actually exist. Yeah. Right. And that potential is falling. The potential is falling. It's falling every day. So we have the population levels are going to be chasing that potential. It's a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that race to the bottom is death. Lots of people are going to die. This is already locked in. This is already happening. All right. So it's not a question of this could happen at some point in the future if certain things aren't done. This is locked in. The only way we're going to beat this is to break out of it by changing, the, by raising the potential. Right. Which means a crash effort to rebuild the global economy at a higher platform level. Uh, a higher level of energy flux density and all that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to get rid of this imperial parasite. I mean, this is the expression, this is what the nation state is supposed to be. The nation state is supposed to be that which fosters the creative development of mankind, like it says in the preamble of our constitution, right? That has a philosophical connotation to it. And that, that's, that's not just some nice, you know, peanut packing that they put in the box to protect the actual constitution. It's, it's actually the substance of the constitution itself. Everything else is a, an expression of what that intention is. Yes, it, it, it lays out the principles by which this nation and which humanity should be organized. And that's what the founding fathers had in mind. It wasn't just that they were creating some other, you know, some niche away from England or something like that. Yeah. They had a philosophical intention which expressed itself, it, it developed, you know, from that time up to the present day. I mean, for instance, you had a, a, a massive spike in population potential with the development of the United States and, you know, the counterparts around the world that were trying to follow the United States. The potential had increased, the population did increase, um, but it was something which is based upon fostering the scientific creative potential of mankind. And that's what the Founding Fathers had as their intention in the development of the credit system. Yes, yes. And that, in the process of doing that, you do the things which create enormous wealth. Mm -hmm. So the United States, the young United States, was the premier generator of wealth, the engine of wealth on the planet, because it followed these principles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's, to people who think, well, what about money? If you think about, all right, we're going to go out and we're going to make money. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take the example of energy, of electricity in particular. All right. Now, the people who think of things in terms of uh, money and profit centers view electricity as something that we should extract the highest price for. You know, if we're going to generate electricity, then as shareholders of the utility company or as people who run the futures market in electricity, we should make as much money as elect from electricity as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the, the opposite viewpoint from that is that because electricity is part of your infrastructure, that electricity is one of those things which increases the productive power of human labor and increases the standard of living of humanity that you should make electricity cheap because of the benefits that you get from it from what it does for the productive power of human labor. And that the, the cheaper you make electricity, the higher standard of living you have. Mm -hmm. So you want the companies that produce the electricity to make enough money to turn a profit. But their existence is necessary for the productivity of the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's a part of the infrastructure. It is not a profit center right. and should ever be viewed as a profit center. Right. Right. And we've turned everything into a profit center and it's killing us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the wrong idea. 
It's the, it's an absolutely incorrect view of how an economy should function. It's like the get rich quick off electricity. Yeah. The casino mm -hmm. model for electricity. Yeah. Or globalization and the ch the chase for the lowest possible wage. Mm -hmm. That if somebody somewhere else will do this same job for less than who's people who are doing it now, we're going to move. Mm -hmm. Or we're going to force, you know, the force US workers to accept third world wages if they want to compete in the global marketplace. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just a crock. Yeah. It's yeah. a lie. Okay. You want your people to earn high incomes because that enables them to have a higher standard of living. So then instead of having to work two and three jobs at a time to try to feed their family, they can have a normal family life. Mm -hmm. You know, they have time for uh, cultural activities in the evening. You know, that people can be more well-rounded. They can do cultural work, scientific work, that they're not locked into this, uh, you know, hamster cage yeah. of work, work, work. That's what it is, yeah. You know? Exactly. That everything that we're doing right now is in precisely the wrong direction. A lot of these things, for instance, that we, we know now about, say, like the 62 million year cycle in the galaxy, uh, the, you know, solar flares and... Uh, uh, nebula and you know gamma radiation or even even galaxies themselves all of these are very recent discoveries and a lot of it was based around uh, a lot of the big discoveries were based around the development of NASA the ability to even observe these phenomena that are occurring in the universe I mean for the longest time for most of the existence of mankind we had no idea these things were going on I think it was to the early part of the 20th century that we discovered what an actual galaxy is, that these are completely separate entire clusters of stars and nebula in themselves. They're not just nebulas floating around out there. So we've just, you know, been able to observe these phenomena. And here we are, you know, wow, we got to deal with this type of stuff. we gotta, we got to really prepare mankind to deal with these things. That, that, that intention, that same intention that produces, like, good living conditions and good culture in mankind also provides conditions for which mankind can deal with these type of phenomena. Absolutely. And if you're going to nurture creativity in human beings, you have to start young, which means that children have to live in stable families. They have to have proper nutrition. Yeah. You know, yeah. they have to have <laughs> good living conditions. I mean, and then they have to have a good education. But you have to have this basic stability of the family unit. Mm -hmm. You have to have the parents around in the evenings. You know, you, ha you have to, people have to be well balanced if they're, gonna, if they're gonna survive and thrive in this. So, you know, you have the cultural, educational activities, the cultural activities, the scientific work, all of these things that you educate a child so that by the time the child becomes an adult, the child has mastered where mankind is already mm -hmm. and is prepared to then explore where we go from here. You mean you don't want to just train them how to gamble on the stock market? Well, no, no. <laughs> you know, the, the dropouts can handle that. Yes, they can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the Wall Street crowd has this view of themselves as the rocket scientists and the masters of the universe. Yeah. And they're really idiots. Mm -hmm. They might be clever people. They might, some of them may be very smart. But they're idiots. They've adopted a world of gambling and betting that is an anathema to the principles by which this universe operates. It sure is, yeah. And they have blown up the world with this stupidity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't seem to understand that. And uh, like any good gambler, you know, they're playing double or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And they're getting nothing right now. They're going to get nothing, yeah. But, you know, all of this stuff that, that we're discussing, you know, that... Glass-Steagall is not the solution to all of our problems. But Glass-Steagall is the step which will put us in the realm where the solutions become possible. Well, take, for instance, FDR. Now, FDR came into a world that was really screwed up. I mean, it was, people were incredibly demoralized. They didn't know what was going to happen with the United States or with anything for that matter. And he comes in and says, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And it's through his 
leadership that we were able to push the initial Glass-Steagall. Now, the, the initial Glass-Steagall was nothing really that new. It was just a reaffirmation of the intention of the United States Constitution and our system. So even though you, had, you still had the Federal Reserve and income tax and all these screwed up things that were in existence along with FDR and a bunch of fascists in the background, you still had the intention to move in the right direction, which I think is, that's what's important. And that was an exp that's the expression of the credit system itself. Yes, yes, and we have to reaffirm it again. Because, you know, Glass-Steagall was an assertion of national sovereignty. This is not, it didn't come from just some desire to change banking policy. Yeah, yeah. Right. It came because the bankers, the British allied bankers of Wall Street, the British Empire, including that aspect of the British Empire, which sits in Boston and on Wall Street mm -hmm. and in other places around our country, had destroyed our economy. And FDR was in a battle with them. There was a drive by the British Empire to impose global fascism in the 20s and 30s. And FDR determined to beat them. And he did. And one of the ways he beat them was through the imposition of Glass-Steagall, mm -hmm. which was an assertion of national sovereignty over the financial system. It broke their back. And it, it kept them at bay for a long time. You know, that, and what, what caused them to come back was not the, any kind of weakness within Glass-Steagall. It was a weakness within the citizens of the United States who lost sight of what FDR had done and what Alexander Hamilton had done and adopted, were brainwashed into going along with this British gambling system. The fact that people went from pro-development and... and you know, what Kennedy had represented in, in the 60s, the early 60s. What Kennedy was going back to, which was Roosevelt, which was really going back, again, to the intention of our, our founding fathers. Not perfectly, but the intention was there, right? Yeah. And then what did you get with the 68ers? You got the stupid. opposite. You got we stupid. We got stupid. Well, you got green. You got, yeah. you got gr these green, sick foot soldiers of Prince Philip running around saying we need windmills and solar panels and, and cut out nuclear power and cut out this and cut out that. We've gone from having a pro-science outlook to being terrified of science. You know, you look at the number of people who think that radiation, any amount of radiation, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Without realizing that without radiation, we wouldn't be alive. Or any amount of bacteria is dangerous. And yet bacteria is essential to human life. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all sorts of things. Things have a purpose. But this hysteria, you know, which we've talked about this before, you know, those of us who grew up watching all these monster movies, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, a nuclear explosion somewhere created some giant creature which then played havoc with the world. Mm -hmm. You know, but this is the same formula that goes back to the days of uh, the British Empire's creation of Frankenstein as an attack on Franklin and electricity mm -hmm. because they did not want the world to move to this higher energy flux density represented by electricity. Right. They did not want that kind of modern world. They've tried to freeze scientific progress at every step of the way. If they had their way, we'd still be back moving around with uh, horses and carriages and candles. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we got the royal wedding coming up. This will be another example for Americans to reflect upon what clowns these people are. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth is now the oldest and crustiest monarch to have ruled. I mean, the fact that that kind of silly ritual still goes on in the modern world <laughs> is just ridiculous. <laughs> you know, you look at that stuff, you have to laugh at these people. If you're not laughing at them, you know, those who, oh, this is so wonderful, look at the... Look at all this pomp and ceremony. Isn't this wonderful? No. That's a sign of civilization death. Yes, that's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> if you like that, you've got a problem. Yeah, you contrast that to what human creativity is, and you, yeah. you see it for what it actually is. Yeah. Like, this is a joke. I mean, these people are an anchor on civilization. And they've been holding us back for 
you know, hundreds of years, you look at the history of the British Empire, which is the extension of the Roman Empire. Yeah. If yeah. you look back at, you know, every time you've had a great mind, right. a Plato, you've had an Aristotle, which is some oligarchic flunky. In his case, he was uh, an assassin for the in a cult of Delphi. Mm -hmm. But Time, you always have these things where you try to undercut, the oligarchy tries to undercut every scientific development because they want people to be stupid. Take that now from the standpoint of the American Revolution. You look at what, our, I mean, even in our Constitution, we protect scientific patents and developments. It specifically says that in our Constitution. Under this system, you're talking, under this feudalist British Empire system, it was it was almost by chance or by luck that some great mind was able to, you know, come forward and express an idea or make an invention or things like that. That was not fostered under the monetary feudalist British system. And it wasn't until we had the United States that a lot of great developments were actually implemented as part of a, a physical economy. Otherwise, it was very, very slow going in the old days before you know, we had a, a republic, a United States republic. Yeah, you had the, you know, the patrons of some of these great people, like Kepler. Yeah. You know, the, some rather enlightened prince, or, or you know, someone of that, that level, who had money, who would fund some research. But it was rare. It was rare. And then you had other people, you know, you had to be very careful what you said. If you look at the way Gauss wrote everything he wrote. Yeah. You know, very careful. Yeah. Because if you get, if you say too much, too openly, they kill you. I mean, he wrote his fundamental theorem in or his first one, I think, in 1799. It wasn't too long after 1789 when people were being beheaded at the guillotine for being too brainy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so this phenomenon goes on, and you have the same thing today. You know, you look at all of the people who, who pretend to be like Lyndon LaRouche. You know, they, none of them, they have to have a bunch of them mm -hmm. because none of them can come close to mastering the, uh, the breadth of his knowledge. You know, but the, the financiers, you have the, the phony Bretton Woods from people like Soros and Felix Rowan, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, wannabes like Joe Stiglitz and other people who are trying to create, keep the imperial system alive while trying to echo some of our ideas. But it's just the same oligarchic trap that you see throughout history. That you're trying to, you know, people want to, people like progress. If you pr show people how they can progress, they'll find that attractive. So you have all these uh, parasites who are crawling around trying to steer that off into some dead end. So now you have Glass-Steagall, the Congress is being told, as, think about the original bailout. Congress voted overwhelmingly against the original bailout plan. And then what did, what was the response? If you don't go for this, you're going to blow up the financial system, which is going to blow up the world. And then, you know, we're going to have to go into all sorts of unpleasant things. Mm -hmm. And then to make sure that this was understood, the Brits launched an assault on the stock market, drove the stock market way down. You know, you had... You had this blitz of chaos mm -hmm. designed to force Congress into line, and it worked. And they've been scared bunnies ever since. They use the threat of pain. If you don't do this, there'll be a yeah. lot of pain. Yeah, you're going to feel the pain. And since you know Congress gets a lot of its money from Wall Street, you know there are also threats. You know, you're basically you're not going to get funded anymore. Mm -hmm. You better get in the line. And then we had the passage, the introduction of Glass Steagall. The Brits came out and made it clear that they would regard Glass-Steagall as an act of war against the British Empire. You're talking about the McCain-Cantwell bill. Yeah. 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 And the, and, you know, or Blanche, the amendment to the... Uh, yeah. yeah right. Blanche Lincoln. There was a, right. there was a move for this. Mm -hmm. And it got stomped. Because once again, the word came down, if you do this, we're gonna just, you're going to blow up the system and then... We're going to hang it on you. And, you know, you also have to remember there are these this police state apparatus which monitors everyone's phone call and say, look, we know you're pushing this and right. we're going to get you. And, you know, there, there's a whole terror side on the other side of this that goes on that doesn't really get talked about and that you don't really, you know has to exist, but no one really 
you don't see it. Mm-hmm. You know, but so there, that's been some very effective operations to try to shut this down. Now, the Brits are right when they say that it would be an act of war against the British Empire. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. that's exactly what it would be. Because we intend to shut them down. Because if we don't shut them down, we're finished as a nation. Mm-hmm. We're finished as a civilization. That the fact that the British Empire still exists and still has power is an embarrassment to all of mankind. And there's that type of pain where the empire says, if you don't do this, then we will, we will take this action, basically. Or you won't get this. You won't, like, for instance, if you don't pass this bailout, all the credit markets are going to collapse and no one's going to have any money. Then everyone's going to lose their home. So you better bail out Wall Street so we can get the credit markets going again. Some insane argument like that. Yeah. Or, or just outright direct threats. I don't know. I wasn't there with the lobbyists in, in the Congress. But, but that's, that's the liberal type of pain, pleasure pain. Like we control the system through this liberal pleasure pain type of approach. But there is real types of pain that do exist in the, in the universe. For instance, we got to be able to deal with the outbreak of massive amounts of earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes or, you know, outbreaks of disease. We have to deal with these sites. Those things are really painful. They're not painful in the liberal pleasure pain sort of sense. They're painful in the sense that, well, if we don't develop the capacity to comprehend and master these processes, then, yeah, this is what you're going to get, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of pain expressed by the universe. The other thing, though, is that you do have a deliberate, a deliberate campaign by some, such as Geller, this guy Geller, to say that you cannot know, forecast, or e- even remotely even think about mastering these processes. Not scientifically proving that, just asserting that and saying it's ridiculous to even think about even trying to figure these th- type of things out. Yeah, you know, your classic oligarchic uh, agent. Just asserts, we can't, we can't do this. We can't figure anything out. We don't know anything. We're incapable of knowing anything or doing anything. Yeah. So, you know, but these people view humanity as sheep. And they like to herd us into the shearing sheds and shear us. Mm-hmm. And then once we're no longer useful to be sheared, then they herd us into the slaughterhouse. Now we've reached the point where humanity is headed for the slaughterhouse. You know, you have like lemmings headed for the cliff. Right. And, you know, you have now amongst the lemmings, you have this mass strike. There's a lot of noise. The lemmings are grumbling. So, look, I, don't, I, think we're, I think we're headed for trouble. Now, what you have to do in a case like that is get out of the damn line. <laughs> Quit walking towards the cliff and change direction. <laughs> right? But that requires courage. Yep. You know, you have to act on your belief. Otherwise, you know, you'll just go right over the cliff. Mm-hmm. So we have a Congress full of people who are cowards. Well, get over it. You've got to pass Glass-Steagall. If you, if you are a patriot, you've got to pass this because the nation is not going to survive if we don't. There's something much more painful than Wall Street's griping and whining. And the British Empire's threats against us. Yeah, although listening to them whine is pretty painful. Yeah. I mean, they're really pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you've got to break with this line of lemmings heading over the cliff and come back to what made America. Come back to these principles. You've got to stand up for something. And these are people who generally don't stand up for anything. And you look at the vast majority of the American people, mm-hmm. all right? They go along to get along. Yeah, yeah, I don't like this, but it's not my place to buck it. If I stand up, you know, you can't buck City Hall. You can't buck the boss. You can't buck the system. Mm-hmm. There's nothing you can do. You just got to make your own accommodations with it because that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. Well, if you believe that, you're going to die. Yeah. Our civilization is going to die. That's not the way it is. The United States was founded by people who rejected that viewpoint and said, we obey higher principles. All right. This nation is something that's much more important than just some structure for 
filling potholes and taking out the garbage. It's important to think of Glass-Steagall from the standpoint of an intention in the direction of the human species. It's not just some issue in Congress, like some nice bill that we want to sponsor because it's going to, you know, separate investment banking from savings and loan banks or put up the firewall. It will do those type of things. But the important thing is that if we don't do that now, we're going to be, we're not going to be prepared for anything that's going to hit humanity. We got to begin there. We got to at least start there. It's not the, it's not like there's some golden answer that's going to solve all the problems, but that's where we have to go. And that's the only thing that we have on the table right now expressed by our federal government that people can grab a hold of and say, here's something we can actually, we can, we can fight for. In, in a sense, you could compare it to, say, getting off the Titanic. It's an actual lifeboat to say it's we're, the getting, lifeboat. we're getting to, off this to, thing. Yeah, to get off. Because if you don't, you're going down with the ship. We know the metaphor all too well. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's real. it's real. Now, this system is going down. But you have to understand that there's a, there's a trap here. You have to understand what this whole imperial trap is represented as orchestrated through the inner alpha group. Yeah. on the financial side actually represent. So, you know, let's review this very briefly, all right? all right? You had the creation of this giant bubble, which served as a cover for the takedown of the physical productivity of the United States, which is what is killing us, mm -hmm. all right? Then you have, so you have, you take down the productivity. You're not really producing wealth anymore. You create all of this debt. Ultimately, that blows up. It has to. Mm -hmm. It was designed to. Okay? That's what has happened to us. That happened in 2007. It blew up. So you enter the next phase of the game, which is to have shift all of the losses from the imperial financiers to the government. That's what the bailout was all about. They basically wrote a blank check, and they've been working on this bailout ever since. And, you know, everything they do is to keep this financial system going. They're pushing austerity on the population. They keep telling us that the problem is Social Security, the problem is Medicaid, the problem is that we cost too much money, mm -hmm. you know, which is all a cover story. It's, yeah, it's while they're stealing us blind. Because the, the real problem is, as we said, that we shut down the physical productivity of the U.S. economy. That's the problem. That's what has to be restarted. That's the only way out. All right. Mm -hmm. But they tell us no, that we it costs too much to keep us all alive. So therefore, that we're, we're the problem. Again, it's always us, right? We're the problem. Yeah, you're the problem. That's why. Yeah, you better believe that. Yeah, it's not the Wall Street crowd. It's not the empire. All right. So, the governments take on this enormous debt. And the governments are already bankrupt because productivity has been shut down. And then the governments take on this enormous debt of the bailout, which they can't possibly pay. Mm -hmm. The debts from the bailout cannot be paid by anyone. The debts accumulated up to the point at which the system blew up can never be repaid because there is no wealth being produced, not sufficient wealth being produced to allow them to be repaid. The assumption is, is that the wealth is in money. When yeah. Lyndon LaRouche has said that, well, money is not wealth. Money can convey what wealth actually is, but it itself is not wealth. Yeah. And, and you devalue what you call money, you destroy in the process through hyperinflation. Glass-Steagall would redefine what money is. Yes. It would totally change the game for these bastards. Yes. Yes, it's changing, it's changing the whole thing. So you have now you have the governments, but through the bailout process, you're creating even more debt. The governments are collapsing under the weight of the debt. The austerity is being pushed all around the world by the empire under the guise of having governments be responsible and balance their budgets, which is just, you know, if it weren't so deadly, it would be a big joke. Yeah. All right, but, but it's, it's deadly. deadly. It it's is dead. Deadly. People are dying. Yeah. All right. Now the whole thing, the game is over. So the plan now is to take all of this debt, to dump it into what we've been referring to as bad banks. Mm -hmm. And it's not just individual banks, but it's 
systems which are being cut loose. Huge chunks of the financial system are about to be cut loose. And a bad bank, just real quick, what's a bad bank? So a bad bank call? is you, you have an institution which is dying, so it takes a bunch of its bad assets mm -hmm. and it hives them off into a, another institution, which they call a bad bank. And then you give it some money and the, under the idea that, mm -hmm. you know, things will, as the recovery comes along. Yeah, these will be okay. Then this, these assets will improve and ultimately they'll be okay. And meanwhile, the parent bank can go about its business and go back to making money again. If you realize, of course, that there is no recovery, there's no intent to recovery, and that what you're really doing is that the empire is dumping all of this debt onto institutions that the nation states have, are guaranteeing. You and me. You and me. You and me. Mm -hmm. And everybody watching. Mm -hmm. Okay. That these things are going to collapse. They're going to take the nation states down with them. And there's not going to be anything left after all the dust settles, but the, what's left of the empire. Real quick though, because what people are told is the problem is, is as things progressively get worse, as the monetary system collapses and living conditions collapse, job opportunities are gone, physical production is gone, what people are told, you know, is that well, the problem is, is your neighbor. The problem is, is them damn immigrants. Or the problem is, you know... Uh, China. 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 China's taking all our jobs. China's taking all our money. Yeah, China. They're over there, and, and, and they're not here. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, China has been subsidizing us for how many years now? <laughs> well, yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the ones who we outsource all of our... Uh, manufacturing and things. The idea that the Chinese are taking our jobs. Yeah. Uh, let's look at that for a second. Mm -hmm. okay. All right? All right. You have these global corporations which control production. Global cartels. Imperial cartels. Mm -hmm. They relocate jobs from places like the United States and Germany and other industrial nations. High, high standard of living nations. High standard of living nations into low standard of living nations in order to cut wages, to mm -hmm. save. Nominally, this is being done to save money. And without those corporations, they wouldn't have jobs anyway. That's right. So they're doing a good thing. They're doing a good thing. It's tough, okay. but you know, we have to be competitive in the world market. Yes. Well, you know, the, all right, let's, first, it's good for this country. Nonsense. It's an assault on this country. <laughs> they are deliberately asset stripping the United States They've deliberately destroyed our economic productivity because they intend to destroy us. Mm -hmm. All right. It's that simple. All right. It's not about making money. If they wanted to make money, they should go back to the American system. You make lots of money that way. <laughs> They're trying to protect this ancient way of life. You know, all this pomp and ceremony of the British Empire and the Queen and her silly little metal hat, you know, and all this crap. This <laughs> no. is what they're trying to save. They're trying to save the, the cult of Apollo at Delphi. Their pristine backyard they call you know, planet Earth. This system that's gone on for centuries. This yeah. is what they're, this oligarchic system, that's what they're trying to protect. Yeah. And we're the threat to that. Yeah. All right. Now, what, what does this do to China? Well, China's making lots of money, right? Sure. Except that China doesn't really have a full set economy. They're trying. They're doing everything they can do. Sure. But you know, having having China, Chinese labor produce cheap goods, goods at the cheapest possible price, which can then be put on ships and brought over here to be sold in Walmart, is not exactly a sound economic model. Yeah, the problem is not the neighbor, it's not the immigrant, it's not the Chinese, it's the system. Who does this to us? It's the empire. Right, and, but we're not looking at that. We're saying, oh, it's, there, it's this guy, it's this guy, it's this guy, it's yeah. this guy, right? And, and who keeps telling us that it's the Chinese? The empire. The empire, yeah. <laughs> and we're so stupid that many of us believe that. Sure. But General Electric, the Chinese did not force General Electric to move jobs overseas. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's it's a it's ridiculous if you think about it that it could work that way. It's a general collapse all over the world. Yeah, it's a general and collapse. When you move these economic processes from a highly skilled industrial nation mm -hmm. into a poorer nation, which is doesn't have that same high standard of living, then you lose a lot of the benefits of that production. So the whole world is undergoing a downshift. All right. At the same time, unless you develop new technologies and are constantly progressing, if you stay at one technological level, let's say one platform like an, uh, an oil-based economy, if you stay at that level, you're using up your resources, you're getting poorer as you go along, your society is actually declining, that this is, you either move forward or you die. Mm -hmm. And we're not moving forward. We're actually moving backwards. And we're, so we're doomed unless we break out of that. And Glass-Steagall is the method to break out of that. Just completely the, break out of it. And to tap, to, to restart the economic conditions whereby then we can begin to tap the creativity of the global population. And the asset we have is the minds of human beings. And it's the intention to foster that. That's what passing Glass-Steagall would do. You're going to redefine the intention of what the economy, what the policy of the federal government is. As soon as you pass Glass-Steagall, the empire is finished. Because the shock wave of that assertion of national sovereignty and the implications of that for the speculative side of the market mm -hmm. means the game is over. The only thing keeping them alive right now, keeping that system going, is this open-ended bailout from the governments of the world. And when you put an end to that, then they're no longer viable. These investment banks, you know, like we've said, we're going to reorganize the banking system. We're going to protect commercial banks mm -hmm. that serve the economy. But we're going to purge them all of all of their crap. And if the investment banks, they can stay in business, we'll just give them all of this funny money, all their monopoly money. Yeah. So, yeah, this is all yours. Yeah, I mean, it's not like we're going to take you know? away their funny money. We're going to let them have it. Yeah. They can keep it. If you think this is worth something, that's them. good. You, yeah. go right, you go right ahead and hold on to it. <laughs> yeah. And they will simply vaporize. Good. With all of their monopoly money. But it's the, the shockwave coming from Plassing Glass-Steagall changes the whole geometry. So it in itself, even though it represents a minor change in the wording of the law, the implications of it go far beyond mere banking regulation, mm -hmm. as the British Empire knows well, which is why they say, you better not do it. It's against their view of mankind. Yeah. But We're going look, to fundamentally change that, yeah. yeah. Sorry. But look at what's happened since we went along with this bailout. Mm -hmm. Look at the way our country is disintegrating. You know, forget the economic statistics. Don't believe a single economic statistic the United States government produces. They lie. They make this stuff up. Or they, they twist it and present it in such a way that the numbers they show don't actually show what they say they show. Well, for example, we saw this recently with the USGS saying that earthquakes aren't increasing, but they had the statistics and they say, well, earthquakes greater than, you know, 7.0 magnitude are not increasing. Yeah. Well, that's true, but they they don't mention that, well, the earthquakes of 8 and greater or 7.9 and greater are those are increasing and those are like, you know, exponentially orders of magnitude more powerful. But it's the statistics they use. They say, well, we'll just set the bar here, and then we can say, well, yeah, see, nothing's going on. Mm -hmm. But you set the bar a little bit higher, everything changes. Yeah. Or look at the, the employment statistics mm -hmm. and the unemployment statistics, the way they run these things. So they'll come up with a number, and they'll say, well, okay, so unemployment, uh, you know, employment was at this level this month, mm -hmm. all right? Well, all right, first of all, that includes the estimates of how many jobs were produced, which turned out to be f phony. <laughs> includes all sorts of phony stuff. And then, you know, the numbers, we've seen this repeatedly over the past couple of years, where then the numbers are revised mm -hmm. before the next month. 
And they actually, you know, it wasn't nearly as good as we said it was. And it's actually much worse than we said it was. But you play this little game where you keep adjusting the numbers. And then periodically you say, oh, well, somehow, you know, our estimates were off and we're going to change everything. So that you keep trying to create a situation where, as it's all going to hell, you can keep showing that it's getting better and better and better. (laughs) All right. The same thing goes with the numbers produced by the Federal Reserve. Why anyone would believe anything the Federal Reserve says at this point is beyond me. (laughs) And that includes their statistics. And yet you see people who write about all these statistics and that you take this number and this number and you look at the relationship between those two numbers and it shows you that things, why even believe that? (laughs) You know, it's crazy. All right. It, It doesn't mean anything. They're all lies because the look at, look around you. How's your job going? How are your neighbors doing? How's your, how's your city government doing? How's your state government doing? How's your federal government doing? They're not all there. <laughs> you know, uh, how many different types of fees and taxes do you find being hiked to cover the loss? Now, you know, they're talking again seriously about a national mileage tax. Tracking, you know, tracking everybody's driving and then charging you by the mile for driving because they say the gasoline tax is not raising enough money because cars are too fuel efficient. Hmm. You know, well, obviously, if since we already have a way to collect gas taxes, if the problem was we're not raising enough money, the cheapest solution would be to increase the gasoline tax. Well, oil is up because, you know, there's a crisis in Libya, John. Oh, Yes. Yes, yes. So, you know, but here's another measure, another type of tax, another police state. This Mm -hmm. stuff is inexorable. Mm -hmm. All right. So how do you beat that? How do you beat the police state? How do you beat the control of the markets over gasoline prices, which is just milking us for everything we're worth? Mm Glass-Steagall. You break the back of the empire. You break the back of all of these operations. You fix a lot of problems all at once. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. You know, that's what we have to do. Well, okay, good. Let's do that then. Hopefully we, that's what we will do. Because that's the only choice we have at this point right now. And as, as we said earlier, you know, fixing, fixing the financial system, re- fixing, fixing our economy because we're going to put this financial system down. Yep. Is the easy part. Yeah. The hard part is we have to then figure out understand the universe and understand the dangers that lie in this universe because the universe is dynamic. It's constantly changing. And it is constantly shedding old systems which have failed. You know, we have this 62 million year cycle with you know, this extinction cycle. All right. So either mankind has to figure out how to live through and make it through one of these extinction cycles, or we may not make it. We may be gone. See, but our system is based upon forming a more perfect union. So that system can is made to conform with the intention of the universe. Yeah. Should be the intention of but you know, at this point we're not expressing that. And Glass Eagle could be a step in that direction. And it would probably change a lot of the people who are either depressed, demoralized, in a state of panic, or just plain crazy. It sure beats following the silly little queen into hell on earth, doesn't it? Yeah. I hope she survives long enough to see Glass Eagle Path. We should do that for her. It would be a good going away gift. We should give this as a gift to the young royals, you know, for a (laughs) wedding present for the prince. Glass Steagall. A big part of giving a gift is what it... You know, how it makes you feel, right? I guess so, yeah. Yeah, if they don't understand the gift, that's okay. (laughs) They'll learn. Yeah, well, the American system is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Especially to these bastards. Yeah, so let's give it to them. Okay, well, let's give it to them. John, thanks. Sure. And uh, we'll see you next time.